can we map that out? Can we make an overview to say, okay, if we look at the main world regions, what are the structural shortcomings? Uh, where do we need to invest more in hardware? Where do we need to invest more in software? Can we do that? Can we map that out? Can we work with, again, partners like World Bank on that IMO to, to set sort of an agenda? Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where you meet interesting maritime professionals sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast listeners, and welcome to the 172nd episode of the Shipping Podcast. So I have released more than 170 episodes of the Shipping Podcast, but I've only touched upon ports, which I think I need to change. Ports are an essential part of the maritime industry and can definitely contribute to the roadmap for a sustainable future. Who better to introduce ports than Patrick Verhoeven, the Managing Director at the International Association of Ports and Harbors, IAPH for short. Patrick is a well-known profile in the maritime industry and a wonder of knowledge, as you will hear. Before we start, I need to say that I went flat on battery when recording this interview. Hmm. Fortunately, I recorded the Zoom call we had, so there was a backup. You always need to have a backup plan. I'm telling you this since there might be a slightly less perfect recording of my voice in this episode. But the main thing is that you hear what Patrick has to say. He is the guest in this episode. I hope you will enjoy our conversation. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Thank you, Lena. Thank you for inviting me to your podcast. Um, my name is Patrick Verhoeven. I'm currently the Managing Director of IPH, which is the International Association of Ports and Harbors. I've been in this role for about four years now. Uh, and before that, I spent almost 25 years in Brussels representing ship owners, ports, terminal operators, with the, um, the institutions of the European Union. So that's I've been in this business forever. I've never known any other sector than maritime. So how did, how, where did that interest come from? Why did you get interested in, in the sea or shipping in maritime? It's a funny story in a way. I had a cousin back when I was about 16. Well, I still have the cousin, but uh, he was uh, he was there and, and he worked for a ship agent uh, for Sealand, actually, the American company, the, the local agency here in Antwerp. And um, he said, you know, you as a, you want to work in the summer or do you, are you looking for a job? And you're know, around 16, that's the age that you need some pocket money. And so he said, why, why don't you come with us? And the agency was, was in the port, in, not, well, not in the city, was really on a terminal. So I went there and I thought, oh my God, I didn't know this world at all. And I was working in the office, but I could go on the terminal and could all with, meet all these people. And apparently I did a good job because they asked me back summer after summer after summer. And I've been doing that until I graduated from university. I always say if my, you know, if my cousin would have been a butcher, maybe my, my professional <laughs> life would have been totally different. But it, it was maritime and I enjoyed it. Uh, it was something very special. It was even if it was a local agency, you had the, the feeling of being part of a, a global thing, especially because it was an American company. And that peculiar culture of, you know, the dockers and people on, you know, in, in the business, I, it attracted me from the first day. I think that that explained it. So what is your educational background? What did you study? I'm an economist. Uh, I studied economics, transport economics as a result also. And uh, yeah, I got a, a late calling. I, I got my PhD in economics about six years ago, which was on port reform and port governance. So I also teach at the university here. I have the, the class of port economics uh, for, an inter for the international program together with a colleague. So in your current role, what is IAPH? What is that? Could you please explain what is what do you do? We are a trade association. So you can compare us to what ICS and BIMCO are doing on the shipping side. That's what we do on the port side. Most of our members are public authorities or port authorities, government owned in most cases, although we also have members who are privately owned. And we look at, you know, 
well, there's two, three roles which typically every trade association would have. So we there's the interface with with regulation. Uh, so we are also represented at the IMO, ILO, World Customs Organization, a number of the other international bodies. And we also try to, um, you know, work together. I mean, in any organization, you have leaders and you have followers. And what we try to do is offer a platform to both, but especially make sure that the knowledge that is generated at the, the front end is also disseminated to the wider community. And, and capacity building is, a, is an important part of our, our task. And, and that's also where we work together with institutions like the World Bank or, or IMO. Uh, we are very active now on digital. Digitalization, uh, because we found also through the pandemic that the digital divide in our sector is actually quite big, bigger than, than we suspected even. So we try to, to work, uh, we, we produced with the World Bank earlier this year, a roadmap on how ports can, can move from the easy steps in digitalization to the more sophisticated smart port uh, concept. Parallel with IMO, we are part of the Green Voyage program, which is uh, meant to help again ports, in, uh, not only ports, but developing countries in taking the measures needed to decarbonize the industry. Uh, and we're working on, in that program specifically on ports. So that's the other role that, that we play is apart from being the voice of the industry, global voice of the industry, we also try to work, make sure that that, uh, that, that sector develops uh, in, in a more coherent way. So how many members do you have? We currently got about 160 ports, individual ports, and we also have around 140 associate members. So, and that, that's a very diverse community. Uh, they are partly service providers to the industry, can be technology, can be um, you know management consulting, whatever. We have academics, we have um, media uh, like like journal and. and I mean, yeah, publications, conference organizers. So there's a very wide range there of, of people who are something have something to do with ports, but are not running the ports themselves. And that's why they are associate members. So what does it look like, the roadmap for the future port then? I mean, I'm so interested in knowing, because I think maybe people think about a port. Yeah, that's just the key side, which is not... <laughs> No, it isn't. And traditionally, of course, it, it was it was, you know, very maritime oriented and, and it still is. I mean, the reason we exist is because of, of shipping. But ports are are what one side is is that is is the maritime part of it. Then you have the whole broader logistics aspect. So the you know we're part of a chain uh, which also has the land based uh, element, uh, road, rail, in some cases inland waterways as well. And then this is not for all ports, but there are many ports who are also industrial locations where you find either energy plants or automotive or or other. So that industries, you know, traditionally used to set up shop close to a port because of the connections, because of the the intermodality. And, and some developed really into like petrochemical clusters and, and others. So it, it is a diverse picture. I mean, the, 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 the very basic model is that of a transshipment port, right? Where a ship calls in, drops the cargo, and another ship takes it away uh, to another location. That's the very minimal model uh, where there would actually go, very little would go into the actual country where, where the port is located. But most ports are, you know, have the import-export role. And as I said, in addition to that, many of them have the industrial function as well. Yeah, it's like an interface also for the, the goods coming to the port could also be picked up by a truck or, or yeah, sure. yeah, train yeah, yeah. and things like that. And people, maybe maybe they don't think about that. No, yeah. no, exactly. Well, The people we know think about that, but maybe not everyone else. <laughs> Well, it depends. I think if you live remotely from a port, maybe you don't. But I think people who live close to it will will probably be more affected maybe by the land side because it it does create congestion in, in many cases. That is, of course, one of the main concerns for ports as well is that they are located, most of them at least, are located within a community, either close to a city or, or an urban an urban environment. And and the yeah the effects of having a port you know that's not just emissions uh, but it's also that it's congestion it, it's it's how do you get more cargo coming in and out of the port can you move it to to rail or can you move it to inland waterways if you have that possibility that is a big concern to a lot of ports uh, to uh, this modal shift on the land side of things and and most local communities will be very vocal about that as well uh, because they don't like uh, seeing trucks uh, piling up 
uh, on the roads and that that that's quite understandable so it depends where you are if you're in the middle of the country and you're really far away from a port and you would probably only think on the shipping side uh, if you live close to it you you might see the other dimension as well yeah but the port i can also i hear people talking about that the port in the future could also be a place where we have uh, the energy transmission i mean we yeah. are looking at new ways that we have to think outside the box yeah and and, and i think there are ports who, who have seen that opportunity to say okay energy transition it's 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 it also needs well it needs transportation in a way uh, but if you have the synergy if you have industrial installations in your port you could work with them also to create um you know the transition you could create uh, you know for instance heat that is produced by by certain plants can be used for other purposes the circular economy concept so you see that some of the ports who have that already that they are working towards that saying how can we optimize it another example which i always think is a, is a, is a great one is is it's a ferry a small ferry port here in belgium ostend uh, which used to be the main hub for the you know Ostend, the traffic with dover in the uk that traffic disappeared for various reasons competition of other ports the euro tunnel and things like that and they've now completely transformed their business model they're they're like a supply port for the the wind energy farms which are off the coast here and they're quite quite big so they specialized in this, a specific type of shipping is is the the support the supply vessels uh the working vessels so they completely reinvented themselves as a port. Uh, there's no ferry traffic anymore, but they now completely are in this business. So there is, there are great opportunities out there as a result of energy transition, that's for sure. Yeah. And how can the port uh, contribute to this decarbonization you were talking about? Uh, the big question that we are thinking about right now. If, if, if we look at shipping in particular, I think that there's four areas. Uh, and the most important one is, is, of course, bunkering. So there's still that debate going on. What's going to be the fuel of the future? How, how are we going to make sure that is available, that the quality is there uh, and the volume, of course, and that it's safe to do the bunkering? That's the number one priority, I think. And we had some experience with LNG which is now only developing, but 10 years ago, people thought that was going to be the real solution, although from a carbon point of view, it isn't. But still, there are some issues which are similar. It's it's the supply, it's the safety, and, and there's some experience out there, I think, that we can use now also for hydrogen or ammonia or whatever whatever the fuels will be. But that requires investment, and it's the famous chicken and egg dilemma. Who, who comes first, the infrastructure or the one that is going to use it? And, and so how can we break that, that dilemma? Pilot projects is probably the answer or part of it, uh, and you see them already experimented. There's a, there's a new coalition now of hydrogen ports, ports that want to invest in hydrogen, and they, they've understood that they can't do it on, on the, by themselves. You need to cooperate. Very much the same story for onshore power, which has been with us for, for a while as well, the cold irony. Same discussion. Uh, it's a big investment. Um, you have to make sure that there is a market for it, that, that people will use it. And then maybe on the softer side, you can provide incentives. You can uh, give reward to ships that are performing better than what the international norm is, is doing. And we have created, again, more than 10 years ago, already an index for that, the Environmental Ship Index, ESI which has a database about four or 5,000 ships in them, uh, and they are ranked according to their um, emission uh, performance. And if you do what is required, then you get no points. <laughs> but if you do better, you get higher points. And based on that index, a port authority can say, look, I mean, we have this, this company or these ships are calling frequently at our port. We give them a reduction in the port use. And we've got about 50 ports around the world doing that now. And we want to stimulate that, that, that there's more. So that's more a softer way of uh, facilitating decarbonization. And the final one is to make sure that ships don't spend more time than needed when they are in the port. So that you optimize the port call so that the, the ship knows well in advance when the bird will be available, that they don't have to wait, can go straight in, do the, the operations and move out again. And so you reduce emissions. It's more efficient and it's also safer. So these are broadly four areas that we recognize and which also the IMO has recognized because there is a resolution on ports and, and greenhouse gases from 2019, which we were part of the process in drafting it, where these four priorities are set on the as regards decarbonization. 
But it also sounds to me that digitalization has to play a role here. Yes, it does. I mean, if port call optimization is, is, is about data in the end, for instance, to give one example, it is about data sharing. And, and while digitalization is, people then think about technology, but I, I don't think that's the real bottleneck uh, because technology is there. It's tried and tested, but it's the trust between parties um, to share data. And that came out very strongly from a survey we did last year around this time. We wanted to know IMO already makes it mandatory to have electronic data exchange between ship and shore. Uh, and we just wanted to know how, how well is that implemented today among ports. And from the survey, it turned out that only one third of those that replied had actually had it in place. One third was doing it, was in the process, and one third hadn't done anything. And we asked why. And it was not technology, it was not budget, it was trust. Trust between, or lack of trust rather. Uh, between the, the parties in the chain, in the nautical chain. Uh, so that's where the real effort has to be. And that requires also the, the input of government to bring people together and, and or the port authority, which, as I said, in most cases, is, is an, an ex, you know, owned by, by some form of government that has the authority, but also can create the trust among parties to, to share the data, because that's what you need in the end. Yeah, it's like... I mean, we are in a trust business. We have been for ages, but this is a new trust. It's a so, sort of a technological trust. Yeah, and a competitive trust as well, because people don't like to share their data because they're afraid that the other party in the chain may use it uh, for commercial purposes. So that, that's where the real issue is. Uh, and I think we've been also, you know, in the industry, maybe been working in silos for too long that, that you have... You know, for instance, customs and port authorities are both very important players, but there's not always a dialogue with them. And that's the reason that we've also now renewed our contacts with the World Customs Organization uh, to, to start working on that because it, they are a key player in the whole administrative process that, that is involved with a ship's call. And if we can make that cooperation better with the ports and more smooth and data sharing, I think we could do the whole industry a great effort uh, so, but that, that's another thing that's a more structural one. Yeah, we have so much data that we either do not capture or we do capture it, but we don't know how to use it. That's right. So I think maybe we could, I mean, we could change a lot just by doing that. Yes. Yeah, I think that that's that's absolutely true. And that's the reason why why this is also for us and has become this great priority and, and the, the plan there to work with World Bank and, and others to get sure, make sure that. This is accepted everywhere. And what is interesting is this is not a developed versus developing world situation. Partly it is, but it, it isn't completely, because if you look at the United States, currently there is only one port that has a port community system. And a port community system is really, it's the, the basic thing you have for data sharing between, between operational parties. And it's it's a concept which is dates from the 1980s already. So it's not, you know, like it's the latest rocket science. But there is currently only Port of Los Angeles who has such a system. And none of the other ports have it. And you can't exactly call the US a developing country. So there is still a lot of work to be done, even within the uh, countries that are on, on the technological side would appear to be among the, the front runners. But that doesn't always mean that in ports or in shipping, they have implemented uh, this technology. Why do you think that is? I think it's the same thing. It, it's again, the yeah parties the trust the maybe not only the trust but also not yeah we, we have data but we don't know how to use them uh, and if we have if we know how what well, I, I think you summarized it very well i mean we may not capture it and if we capture it we may not be willing to share it with others i think that's the essence could it also be the same discussion as it is going on between you know about autonomous ships and then people are a little bit afraid of maybe losing their job because of digitalization, which is probably not true, but... Part of it, I suppose, is is that. I mean, automation, yeah, that has a direct, of course, implication when on workers. And, and we've, we've had some experience with automation in ports because first automated terminals already came in the 1990s. They've never been, and they still haven't been sort of wide, become widespread. I mean, there are some leading ports around the world where you find automated terminals. But it's not like it has become the norm, even though the, the technology is already there since the 90s. And maybe that partly has to do with reluctance of workers, although I think it also has to do, at least as far as I know, that 
Terminal operators in many cases still prefer the traditional uh, approach with cranes and straddle drivers being, you know, being operated by people because it gives them more flexibility. Uh, that's at least what I hear always when, when you speak to terminal operators. Say, Why haven't you gone for a semi or fully automated terminal? They say, well, we, we, we're not convinced it will make us more efficient. Interesting. I don't know. I'm not, a, I, you know, too into the, the detail of the operations, and but it might be an element why the, the, the uptake is so slow next to yeah, the social element, of course, which is, is the other one. Hmm. Have you seen any impact of the pandemic? Yeah, of course. Yes, we saw an impact. We measured it actually. Uh, every, initially, every week, uh, we put out a barometer in the first half of the you know the period when it all started. Then we went to a more monthly basis. But we we looked at a number of indicators: the vessel calls and capacity in the warehouses, and and also further um, in, into the chain and the availability of workers. So there were a number of indicators that we that we measured over time. And of course, initially we saw a big strain on all of them, but that eased relatively quick, I would say. I think all in all, the the the, the port-related supply chain remained intact. But we have seen then regional differences as well, where, where there were indeed issues with either too little capacity or too much, depending on which side that you, that you are. And of course, more recently, that has become really an issue uh, in some parts of the world, partly still due to the pandemic and then more with to do the increased demand. So people that you know are not spending the money on holidays, but they're spending it on garden furniture or redoing the kitchen or whatever. So they, they need supplies that has increased demand. And that has exposed a number of congestion issues that may already been there, but they've now become really dramatic. I can think of the West Coast of the US, where you have about 30, 40 ships on average waiting to before they get to the berth, which has also to do with the fact that terminals are not open 24-7. And the question is, is this now a crunch that will go go away and we will go back to a normality, or will we see an increased level of demand also in the future? And, you know, now container lines are making money now as a result, making a lot of money as a result, but they're not offering the service that they can because the whole supply chain isn't adapted. And I think that's that's for us is really going to be a big discussion in the year forward is to say, and it will not be the same. You can't say globally ports, the capacity is not there. It will be regional. And it's not only a matter of infrastructure, it's also about the working arrangements, you know, the, the, the softer uh, elements, uh, the software, not just the hardware. Can we map that out? Can we make an overview to say, okay, if we look at the main world regions, what are the structural shortcomings? Uh, where do we need to invest more in hardware? Where do we need to invest more in software? Can we do that? Can we map that out? Can we work with, again, partners like World Bank, that IMO to, to set sort of an agenda? That's what I would like to do this year now with, with this opportunity of, well, every crisis is an opportunity <laughs> uh, and see if we can can come to that mapping out exercise and come to regional priorities and, and identify them and work towards solutions. Because that's the thing with a global association, you know, for, especially for ports. I think shipping is different because shipping regulation, there's much more global regulation for shipping than for ports, which is normal because it is a global industry and a shipping company operate, operates everywhere, whereas we are local. So our our global regulation for ports is more complicated. It would tend to be more regional or national in the end. But you can facilitate the process on a global level by identifying, by comparing, by bringing in global institutions. And that, that's a bit our program for the next months. Yeah, and, and the discussion that we hear about maybe taking production closer to to consumption in a way, that might also have an impact on the entire system. Yes. Because uh, as we see, there has been some ports have been bigger and bigger and bigger and become hubs. And then you have uh, smaller ships maybe going into the each country where the, with the goods. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 it's certainly part of the conversation. And I'm not sure whether it will lead to a dramatic shift. I, mean, I think because I think this global chain will still be there. And, you know, not all production, I think, is going to move from Asia now to closer to home. But 
we might see some effects and there could be more opportunities for like short sea shipping to develop and for, for regional ports to, to become more busy in the sense that they can decongest some of the bigger ports. So that certainly, I think it's part of the, the whole the whole conversation. Um, let's see how that pans out in, 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 the next, in the next months, whether it will become a structural factor or not. I mean, Europe, certainly there's a lot of experience in, in promoting short sea shipping as a, as a mode of transport. Um, which which could be interesting also for other regions to look at, you know, both the success and the failures that that have been there. Hmm. So how can we become more visible? How how can we become more part of the general public's mind? By by having your podcast <laughs> <laughs> spread all over the world. No, I think because we're not having a technical conversation here. I think that's that's the good side of. It. I mean, we need to talk about. This is a people's business in the end, shipping and ports. Uh, and, and my little story, how I got into it, is also a people's story in the, in the end. No, I think we probably we've been too focused for many years on on the hardware and in ports certainly. I mean, it's been an engineering business. Most CEOs of ports until 20, 30 years ago were engineers. Nothing wrong with engineers. I mean, but but you know, people then tend to think, okay, this is all about number of boxes and and and, and square meters and capacity, and that's the story we we've been sort of familiarizing familiar with. But our story is much more exciting in a way. It's it's about you know bringing goods from one part to the other, bring connecting worlds, uh, and and you, we have a lot of fun people in the industry. I think more than we more than we think actually, and we should bring them out. You know, bring the faces out. We run a magazine in IPH, Ports and Harbors, we've been doing since we were created in 1955. And and the evolution there is a good example. I think until maybe even only five, six years ago, what we put on the cover was a terminal, cranes, boxes. Now, since, since about a year, we only put people on the cover. People who make our industry, but also people from outside our industry. But the next issue, we will have a member of the European Parliament on the cover who is working towards this emission trading scheme. So who are very relevant to, to our industry. I think that that's where, in my view, is the key. We should move away from talking shop, talking more about you know what drives us, what, what are the people, what are the great ideas that are floating around. And then maybe we will become more visible. Unfortunately, we do become visible when things go wrong, as as we have experienced in the last uh, months with Suez and and now with this whole supply chain crunch that people will notice because their washing machine is somewhere stuck in between the two parts of the world. So then then you become visible, but that's not the way we would like to be visible. No, but we we do so much good and we con- contribute so much to society. And that is what we want to show. Yeah. However, I have spoken to journalists and they say, well, we never write about the building that is not on fire. So that yeah. is the answer to why they are not writing about us. So we need to present ourselves. That is that is my view anyhow. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And that's why, you know, a shipping podcast like this is very good because it you, you've had so many people on there. So diverse a range of people also. And I think that's the other great story. It's not, we're not just captains and engineers. I mean, there are so many people driving this industry, some in, in the most unexpected ways. I think that, that that's the great thing about a podcast like this. That's what I'm trying to do with our magazine as well, is, is to, to, to show the readership that it's more than, than, you know, the technical side of things. But we do have that image of being very technological and also maybe Maybe a little old-fashioned in a way. I think that's the other perception that we have against us. And maybe a little male-dominated. Yes. So, which leads us into, you have also got a female organization within IAPH. There's a women's forum that was created in 2012. By then, our president was a woman, was Geraldine Nats from uh, LA at the time. Um, She was the, the main driver. And with that forum, what we've done is we created the scholarships to um, encourage female workers, employees to follow uh, training. So as a result of that scholarship, you can go with a, an institution of your choice, uh, follow a course, and that is partly then funded by us. So that's been going on for a while. Uh, I think it's time to also here to to look at other things. I mean, like mentoring, and there are many other opportunities out there, but it's been going doing great as, as a network as well. That's how it initially started, basically. But I think we need to go a bit further uh, and, and make it a bit more ambitious, maybe, and look at a whole broader, you know, debate on inclusion and, and you know, diversity in, in the industry. 
so that that's clearly the the way forward there but um yeah it's been good to have that to have that network so what is the best part of being in your position now oh well the good thing is that that there's a lot of freedom uh we are not a very well we're structured but but in the sense we are a bit of a loose <laughs> group of people because we got our historical headquarters are in tokyo so we have people working in tokyo i'm in antwerp i've got another colleague two other colleagues here in belgium uh, i got one in greece and i got one in london and so we're all we we've we've been working from home and distance before the pandemic years before the pandemic and it in a way it works so we're not you know very hierarchical it's so i i enjoy that very much in a, in a role like this that you can use your creativity you know use the network uh, but we're not sort of hard structured uh, in, in that sense uh, that that's one great thing that i enjoy and apart from that although i haven't seen anybody uh, until last week at london shipping week uh, is is yeah that fantastic community that that we have i mean that, that was so good coming back last week so in in, in september uh, to the london shipping week that all these people are there they're enthusiastic uh, you know there is a vibe I don't know whether other industries have that as well. I don't know because I don't know any other industries. I've only worked in this one, so that's probably the other general about maritime. The first thing is about this specific job that I have, but generally, if I look back on on the thirty years that I've been in the industry, is it's that it's that sort of yeah family spirit almost. I would say we all know each other. People move jobs, but we will all we bump back into them. I mean, people hardly leave maritime after a certain while. Which I think is great. No, oh, you get you get the bug. You get the bug. You get the bug. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe in the first five years or ten years, that's but but once you're over a certain time, people stay on and they move. Maybe some from very, yeah, a good example. Paddy Rogers, I think maybe, maybe he has been on your shipping podcast already. From maybe you should have him. That's my recommendation. He was with Euronav. He was the CEO. He's now director of the Maritime Museum in Greenwich. Which is a completely, of course, different, uh, but it's still maritime. And we have him as an editor now in our uh, a commenter. He makes, a, how do you call it, a column in our magazine, and he writes great stuff because he's been in the industry. He's now sort of outside, but still maritime, and he can speak his mind. It, I think is a good guest for your next uh, one of your next podcasts. But that's what I mean. Me, people move sometimes from very, you know, odd dimensions so from an operational role to run a museum is is quite you know extreme but they're still within the same maritime family that's great yeah i re- I, i agree i totally agree and that is one of the things that makes me want to continue and want to let the world know how great yeah. we are in this industry yeah. and that they should try and and get in <laughs> yeah absolutely no I, i agree i think it's a wonderful initiative to do this mm. thank you for taking the time patrick thank you lena it was it was my pleasure Thank you, Patrick. I agree with you that we need to talk less shop and more about the people in the industry. We often say that the maritime industry is a people's business. Then, of course, we have to speak about the people. We have to make them visible. How else can we build trust into the nautical chain? Before we close, I just have to share something with you that I experienced for the first time yesterday. I was at a gathering. Yeah, think about that. Just think about a gathering. One of the first ones after the pandemic. And I met with some of my younger colleagues. That means two young men with small children comparing the challenge of not being the last one to pick up their kids at preschool in the afternoon. I don't think I've ever heard that discussion before. Not in a maritime gathering anyhow. But it made me really happy. We are finally seeing some progress here. So the next episode is a real treat. You will get to listen to the CEO of the Maritime and Port Authority of Singapore. But that is in two weeks. So until the next time, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to the shipping podcast don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry 